go, what do you expect? There is a story that I heard this week, and to the best of my knowledge, it's a true story. There was a clinic in a city, a free medical clinic, and you know, patients would go there for their care, and sometimes, you know, short-term stuff, like immediate things like a sore throat or bronchitis, but sometimes it was long-term stuff, like cancer or AIDS. And one time, one day, there was a substitute doctor on, and because he was the substitute, he didn't know the patient's histories, and he was rushing around through the day trying to catch up because he had to, you know, flip through their histories and figure out what was going on. He came in to wait on one particular patient, a young man, and he flipped through the history and he took the man's blood pressure and he took his stethoscope and he listened to his heart and his lungs. He wrapped his stethoscope back around his neck, doodled a few things in the chart, and looked up at the young man and said, you know you only have a few weeks left. The young man was sort of taken aback. I mean, he knew he'd been terminally ill, but the bluntness of the substitute doctor's words were much different than the comforting words of the normal physician. The doctor left the room, and the young man gathered out his things, and he came out to the reception desk, and he talked to the nurse. And he said to the nurse, that doctor took away my hope. She looked at him for a minute and she said, well, maybe you need to find a new one. Maybe you need to find a new one. A new doctor or a new hope? The young man had knew he was dying, but he had somehow been holding on to the hope of living longer. And now that he knew that his physical body was not going to hold out. He needed to find a new hope. A hope in something greater and larger than our physical lives. We light the candle this morning that is traditionally known as the candle of hope. The candle of hope. What is your hope this holiday season? What do you expect to get now, if you ask my daughter that question, wherever she went to, my daughter expects to get a number of things. There's a list on my refrigerator, as a matter of fact. Yes, she expects things out of the holiday season. I expect an overextended schedule. I expect probably an overextended financial situation. But neither of those things are really what this season is about, are they? Reese reminded us so beautifully, I mean, out of the mouths of children, Christmas is about Jesus. And our hope needs to be in Jesus. We have two really beautiful stories today in our scriptures. From the Hebrew scripture, we're in Isaiah 64 today. And so, if you want to turn with me, I just want to talk a little bit about the format of this. The Hebrew scriptures have some really beautiful prayers called laments. Now, when you think of lament, what do you think that means? To cry out, right? To cry out, usually in some kind of despair or sadness. And in the Hebrew tradition, there are three basic parts to a lament. You have, first of all, a description of the distress, like this is the problem. You then have a plea for God's intervention, and usually it's a very specific plea for God's intervention. And then you have this sort of praise or this acknowledgement that yes, indeed, God is in control of the situation. So, let's look at this. Now, they're not necessarily in that order. Sometimes you have the plea, and then you have the description, and then you have the assurance. Sometimes you have the description first. So let's look at the first one. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. So here, this is the plea. This is what they're asking. God, would you please 
come down. You might be noticing a theme here today. We've had lots of songs about come thou long expected Jesus. While we are waiting, come. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Do you see the theme? We're waiting for Jesus to come. That's the whole hope of Advent is we're waiting for Jesus to come. So we're asking God to come down. That's the plea. I'm going to skip down a little bit to verse 6. This is the problem. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. What's the problem? People are sinning. We don't talk about that word sinning, do we? Sinning? We make mistakes, right? Or we fall short. But sin, sin is what separates from us from God. And these people have become like one who is unclean. One that's wearing filthy rags. Shriveled up like a leaf. Have you noticed the dead leaves laying around? They kind of a smell, right? Might like or not like that smell, but there's a sort of smell about the dead leaves. People in Israel were dried up. Just so you know, Isaiah is actually considered to have been written by three people, most likely. And you'll find scholars will say it both ways, but I'm going to give you this one um, opinion. There are three sections to Isaiah. The first section is before they get carted away into Babylon. There's a section in the middle that's while they are in exile in Babylon. And then there is this section near the end, the third section, where they've come back to Jerusalem. But what do you know about Jerusalem? Whenever the Jews were carted off to, is carted <coughs> off to Babylon, what happened to the temple? Solomon's temple. They burned it. It destroyed it, right? Absolutely destroyed it. Pillage took everything that was worth anything out of it and burnt what was left. Who lived in the temple besides the people? God. Thank you. I'm glad someone's on the phone. The presence of God lives in the temple, right? So when the people came back to Judah, to Jerusalem, and there was no temple, <coughs> they believed that there was no presence of God left. So they just kind of did their own thing. Does that sound familiar to you? Is there anything about the world we live in that makes you think that people don't believe in the presence of God in this world? They're just kind of doing their own thing? Wow. Thousands of years ago, and almost 3,000, and now, wow. So, that, that's the distress. The, the, this person who's writing is saying, God, come down. That's the request. Because we have this horrible situation where people don't think you're here. They're not acknowledging your presence. They're not acknowledging that you're part of us. And then in verse 8, there is this assurance that, yes, indeed, God is still around. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. We know, God, that in spite of how it looks to the world right now, we are your creation. That's the lament. The lament is this cry saying, God, come now. Because we know that you are the potter. You are intricately involved in the daily lives. Every blade of grass, every leaf that falls, every sun that rises and sets, you, oh God, are part of that. In the midst of this lament is this beautiful phrase, and it's in verse 3. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down. Now in modern language it would be when we least expected it, you showed up. When we least expected it, you showed up. 
Does God show up in your life at unexpected times? Let me tell you a little story. Last Saturday night, we had been to the Hollidaysburg musical. We had been out for ice cream. It was around midnight when we came home. And of course, we had to get up for church Sunday morning. And my daughter announces to me, I need a Santa hat for the parade tomorrow. Well, I know that there was a Santa hat somewhere in my house. But if you've seen my little corner of the office, multiply that by about 10 and you can imagine my storage room. I don't even know where the Christmas boxes are, let alone the Santa hat. So I'm debating. Do I run to the store before the break? You know, because it was a busy week last week, right? You know, I had to come to church. We had church stuff going on. We had stuff after church going on. I thought, uh, do I run to the store and try to get a hat somewhere in that for her, or do I just send it without the hat? So I'm doing some laundry, and I said, while I'm doing the laundry, I say a little prayer. I'm like, Lord, I don't know what to do here. Help me find this Santa hat. So, my washer is here. I walk over here to where the shelves of storage things are. And I'm looking to figure out where the Christmas boxes are. And just all of a sudden, this little piece of white fur just kind of like stuck under a, a decorate, like a, under a flower arrangement, a silk flower. I thought, that looks like a Santa hat. And I pull it out, and lo and behold, not only is it a Santa hat, it is a brand new Santa hat with the tag still on it. I probably bought it last year thinking that I'll have it. And I came out and I said to my husband, God just showed up. Now, Rich is used to me. You know, look, we've been married 25 years, but he thinks I'm crazy. And he looked at me like, yeah, really? You know, that seems like such a small, trivial thing. But in my opinion, God showed up in my life. And I acknowledged him and thanked him for that gift. Now, sometimes that's a really tiny little gift. And I've had much bigger gifts. Like, there have been times in our married life when we literally did not know how we were going to put gas in the car and a check will show up in the mail we weren't expecting. God shows up. Often. What do you expect? Now, some you could also ask the same question in a little, with a little bit of sarcasm, put me. Well, what did you expect to happen here? You know, like if, for example, I uh, I forget to put gas in my car, what do I? Expect? You know, what's going to happen? You're going to run out, right? And be stuck somewhere. And, and and my husband, who comes to rescue me, will say, Well, what did you expect? If I don't put money in the bank and I keep writing checks, <laughs> yeah, I heard the auto. Yeah. Next thing you know, you've got overwrite charges and back things are bouncing and you're embarrassed. There's a bit of a cause and an effect to God's presence in the same way that. There was a cause and effect to these flower bulbs we planted for the children this year. When we do certain things, we can expect certain things. If we focus all of our energy and all of our time this Christmas season on cards and trees and lights and presents for our kids and our families, we are not going to sense God's presence. What do you need to do to see God's presence this holiday season? Why don't you turn with me to Mark 13, which is our other text this morning. Mark 13, we're starting out at verse 20. Thank you, I can't read that little number. 24. I can see that that's where I want to be, but I can't see the number. But in those days, 
days following that distress. Now, there is some distress happening in Mark. As you may recall, Mark is most likely the first written of the Gospels. It's probably why it's the shortest. He didn't have as much time to embellish it. So Mark is writing it down because they are in crises. It's around 70 AD. And do you know what happened in 70 AD? I'll give you a clue. It goes back to the temple issue. Solomon's temple had been destroyed in Isaiah, and then they rebuilt another temple. And what happened in 70 AD? It was also destroyed. Absolutely. Because there was an uprising. The Jews had gotten impatient with waiting. I think I must be. Jewish. The Jews had gotten impatient with waiting, and there was some political unrest, and there was an uprising, and the Romans are like, we're done with this. Like, no more patience. No more patience at all. And they, once again, destroyed the temple. And as we said before, the Jews believed that the, that the presence of God resided in the temple. And they had to now start to rethink what they believed about the presence of God. And of course, the early Christians were Jewish, right? They were Jewish Christians. And so there was this real fear and pain about the uprising in general, the destruction of the temple. And now that the temple was destroyed, people were pointing fingers. And people were starting to look at the Jewish Christians and say, it's all your fault. And so there was this additional persecution that was happening to them. I mean, talk about lament. They had a reason to lament. There was, it was a really horrible time to be a Christian. It was a time of distress. The other thing that was happening at that time was there were a lot of false prophets. There were a lot of people coming and saying, well, I am the Christ. Can't you tell? I've already returned. The second coming the, has already happened. No need to wait any longer. And people were confused. And it was a really good time for Mark to draw them back to the words of Jesus. And Jesus reminds them that at that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Jesus had said these things years earlier, and now Mark is writing it down to remind them. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. There were going to be some signs. There were, there were things that were going to happen at the cataclysmic end of time. Now, we're still waiting for that, right? We're still waiting for those signs. And every year when we get to Advent, it, you know, we have these scriptures about end times to remind us that Jesus is coming again. God is coming again. With a big cataclysmic, you know, trumpets in the clouds, gathering up the believers, there's going to be an end. But not yet. In the meantime, we are waiting and asking God to come daily in our lives. And there's this beautiful part that says, no one knows the day or the hour. We don't know. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be sometime long after all of us are dead and buried. But verse 35, therefore keep watch. Therefore keep watch. Several times in this passage, Jesus tells his followers, keep watch. Be alert. We talked about what you put into something is what you're going to get out of something. Part of what we need to put into our Advent season is time to keep watch, to, to be alert. Now, there's a variety of ways to do that. Randy invited you to come to Sunday school. If you're not a Sunday school person, come to Sunday school just for Advent season and spend some extra time keeping watch. There are beautiful devotionals on the back table. Take those home and make some extra time this Advent season to keep watch. Come to church. Hang out in the community of believers. Go caroling. 
with other Christians. Do things that focus the season on Jesus and his coming, not on all the trappings of a world that is shriveled up and dying. Well, what do you expect out of this holiday season? You're going to get what you expect. Look for God in the unexpected, as well as the expected. Look for God in the budding of life of the flower bulb. Look for God in the faces of people you meet as you travel and as you shop. Look for God in the pages of the scripture and in the gathering of the community. What do you expect out of the Christmas season? Expect that Jesus is coming. Amen.